Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of The Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I am your host, Damon Pastolka, and I am so excited for our guest today because we have none other than Sarah Murphy, or Murray, not Murphy, what the heck am I doing? Sarah Murray here today. And I'm so excited from talking, talking with you earlier. We're going to be talking about business prospecting on purpose from the prospecting guru, the person that I, I so admire your approach to prospecting. So Sarah, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Damon, for having me. I'm really excited to be on the show and a chat today. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, you were on the Manufacturing E-Commerce Success Series with Kurt and I a while back. And I was like, man, we got to talk about prospecting a bit more. We got to get some some background story on you, Sarah. So, Sarah, we always like to start out learning a little bit more about you and how you got into doing what you're doing today. Well, so, yeah, it's I go, go it's so funny because I feel like when you start to look back at your life and your career and like find those little pivot points, I when I was building my business, I think I had a little aha moment. Growing up, my mom worked for Delta and we would fly quite a bit as a family, but we would never be able to sit together as a family because when you fly as an airline employee, you yep. kind of fill in the empty seats. So almost never did we sit together as a family? So I was always sitting next to a stranger. I was like a kid. And I, you know, back in the days when they served nice plain food on, you know, nice plain food, but like meals. Yeah. I, one day I asked someone next to me, Hey, excuse me, are you going to eat your chips? And I think they were so confused that this little kid just asking them for their chips that they'd give me their chips. And then if they didn't give me the chips, that was also okay. Like it just kind of opened a door to a conversation. And I look back and I'm like, that's totally where, you know, kind of the gift of gab comes from is the ability to talk to anyone because they really quickly learned it didn't matter if they gave me their chips or not, really. It's like you're just having some type of icebreaker to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think that gave me a lot of confidence at an early age in talking to strangers for, for good or bad. Who knows? But um, mm -hmm. I like to look at it as good. So that's, I think, kind of the, the first pivot point was just flying on airplanes and just chit-chatting with strangers on the plane. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about that and, and being, being the, the daughter of airline employee, what was the coolest place you flew to? Um, we went to Italy as a family and I thought that was really there wonderful. Um, but right before I graduated college, I think I'm trying to remember at what age you lose your, as a child of an airline employee, you lose your yeah. flight status. And our, we had a dog that was going to pass away. She's really old. And so I was going to stay home with the dogs and my parents and brother were going to go to Ireland. And my brother said he didn't want to go. I said, well, I'll go. And it was my senior year of college, had a bunch of finals due. And I was like, it'll be fine. And I didn't make the plane back from Ireland. So I'm pretty sure I landed back from Ireland, drove straight to got to my campus and took my business law final. I got like a B plus on it. So it's there kind of go. funny. It's like, all right, but um, Ireland, Italy, you know, I like, I like very traveling. Cool. I like people. So very blessed there. Very cool. So what is to you has been the most fun about learning how to be, how to prospect, just the, just the process mm -hmm. of how to prospect. I think one of the things that I didn't really realize was a skill set until I started understanding how to teach it and share it with others is I think that confidence piece that you hold in yourself and by sharing with other people, the ability on how to build their own confidence. I think that's something that's been really interesting because in my career, you know, over the years, I've been able to get to very high profile decision makers, very accomplished professionals, a lot of household names that we've heard of. Um, I've had success selling many, you know, multi million dollar orders. And 
I realized that, you know, Sarah Murray at whatever age could get a meeting and I could get a meeting by having confidence in adding value to the other person. And so I think that's something I didn't really realize was a skill set until now. I'm I'm trying to look at different holes in the market and where people are struggling and where they're asking for help. I think that confidence piece is a really important piece, but it has to almost come first, like this inner knowing that you know you can do it, even if you don't know if you can do it, you know, and I think that's the, mm-hmm. that's the delicate dance that we do is having confidence in our efforts and what we bring to the table. But how do you show it in a way that's not arrogant, that doesn't turn people off? And how can you do it in a way that connects with others? So I think confidence is kind of the first step internally. And then connecting with other people is the second step. And if you have confidence in yourself, any other connection is not scary. Mm hmm. Yeah, and writing some, uh, yeah. Well, you said building that confidence. I think it starts with the confidence in adding value, as you said, mm-hmm. from my own apprehensions of, of prospecting, that if you don't have that confidence in adding value, honestly, mm-hmm. adding value in that mm-hmm. with that person, boy, it's a hard it's a hard thing to do to pick up the phone or, or contact somebody or walk up and talk to somebody. That's exactly. Sure. I, a big part of what we focus on in, in the workshops that I host for sales teams is my acronym that I love to say all day long. It's on every piece of playbook. It's post-it notes on our office. It's A-B-A-V. Always be adding value. You know, I think the old like ABC, always be closing. I, I like that too. I'm a hunter. I like the sales process, but that needs to be retired because I think that always be closing mentality is not how people want to do business anymore. And if you can kind of reframe it as this ABAV, always be adding value. Anytime you approach any type of interaction, whether it's with a prospect, a colleague, um, a, another vendor, you know, however you're interacting with people, if you can frame it as how can I add value to the other person? that's just naturally going to make you more confident in approaching because you're not asking for anything. And I think what we, what we struggle with when we prospect is we're asking for something from someone else, but we don't have any, I call it, you know, the emotional bank account. We don't have any deposits in the bank account. So it's really hard to go up and ask for something coming out of the account. Mm -hmm. And I think we see these examples every day. Like Damon, I'm sure your LinkedIn in mailbox is full of people just offering, you know, asking you for business without offering anything. And Mm -hmm. when you look back and think about the ones you respond to, it's usually the people adding value to you or solving a problem. Mm-hmm. You're not asking. Yeah. You're, not, you're not responding to the people just trying to take from you without adding any value. So ABAV always be adding value. That's like the number one takeaway I'd want the audience to leave with is that's going to change your confidence in how you approach things. Yeah, and I I like that approach too. A because I think you're spot on. People don't want to be sold anymore. They want to understand. You know they all the other things too, but that always be adding value is so important because wasting somebody's time is not only a waste of your, their time, it's your time as well. And and when you really look at that in, in a sales or a business development role, you want to be more effective. Right. So if you can ensure that you are going to be able to add value in that situation before you're in that situation, it, it's, it's so much better. Um, and you're right. It's, it really the always be closing thing you get the wrong customers too even if you do close Mm -hmm. i think Mm -hmm. agreed yeah very cool i feel like too one of the things when we think about prospecting is we always think about customers that are new customers but a lot of times we can prospect within our clientele and the way that we do that is by always adding value you know if you contribute Mm -hmm enough value and, um, you know, resources, partnership, collaboration with your client. Very often the way I've been getting new business is referrals or someone just believing so much in what I can do to benefit their company. That's why I've been getting a lot of incoming business, but it's not by me going out and hunting for it, really. It's about building the relationship with the contact that I have, adding value and giving them enough eyes to almost go out and sell on my behalf too. So you can Mm -hmm. kind of prospect for new business with with business you do not have, or you can prospect within your existing clientele 
And, you know, it's a very reciprocal business. People are happy to help if there's reciprocity. But mm -hmm. if you add enough deposits, now it's like, hey, Damon, can you introduce me to so-and-so over here? You know, you have a deposit in my emotional bank account because you invited me to be on your show. You aren't asking me for anything besides my time, but it benefits me, too, to come and talk to you today. So it's just one of those things where it's this feedback loop. And I think that's where business ought to be and where people have a lot of passion and joy in it if we can get that that feedback loop because then it doesn't feel salesy it just feels yeah. like we're helping build other people's businesses yeah yeah that's that's so so clutch it's so clutch and key to to really because we more than ever we want to build relationships in business i believe and i and i man i'm going to tell you i'm old enough to to remember when it was to always be closing and just slamming and trying to do that and and it it is so much better when you can build relationships. And the one thing that I see happening in business today that I really, really do uh, feel feel good about is we're bringing the human element into business again. And we're, we're you know, not trying to do this, excuse me, bullshit about trying to, you know, leave your feelings at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just look this week, we're talking about mental health day, which wasn't even a thing how many years ago, but we got people killing themselves and all over in any different situations. And we, this, the, these relationships that we build are so important and, and adding value can be as simple as just you talk to somebody today and ask mm -hmm. them how it was going. You know, it's, it's, there's so many ways that we can do that. And when, when you're in the business setting and you're in the prospecting, I mean, I and I I now I don't say I enjoy prospecting, but I enjoy talking with people just because I want to help them however I can. If business comes of it, well, that's great. But if it doesn't, I want to still be able to help them and leave them with some something. And uh, that's that's what I always enjoyed about our conversations because you have so many wonderful examples <clears throat> where you you've been able to do that. So as you've gone through your career and now, now you're coaching, you're doing webinars and we're going to talk about that stuff later, but what are some of the things that you just, that felt right that you were like, well, maybe business, maybe not in a business setting, but they really have, have worked well for you over the years. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I appreciate that question. But just kind of thinking back to our conversation of the pivot points. When I first moved to, I, I grew up in Utah. I moved to Los Angeles, I think I was 23. So moved to LA when I was 23 and I got my first job and it was a marketing role. And I enjoyed it. You know, I built the catalogs, built our point of purchase sales. I do all the trade show stuff. And the first big trade show I went to, it was um, more of a buying group show. So you had mm -hmm. set appointments and the sales director had laryngitis. She full on lost her voice and could not talk. And I, you know, I loved it because we ended up, I, you know, meet the people. Hey, where are you, where are you located? What do you do? Who's your client? What did, you know, just the normal chit chat. And I would open their account, send them down to Patricia with her lost voice and she'd do all the paperwork. And we ended up opening like 60 accounts in two days. It was such a killer trade show. And at the end of the trade show, this man, husband and wife team, I think they were based in Boulder, Colorado. He said, thank you. He's like, thank you so much, Sarah. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I need to be thanking you. You just bought for me. And he turned my shoulders and he's like, look around at all of these other booths. And all of the booths were just table, literature, people sit down talk about their product, you know, and this on our booth, oh, yeah. we got rid of the table, we got rid of the chairs, we made them stand like we're talking. And I think that that was one of the things where I do think people get into autopilot mode. And if you can bring energy and authenticity, that's going to differentiate you. And it's a lot more fun to show people the real you. And I think as I've, as I've grown, my authenticity has been one of my strongest assets. And my clientele is luxury hotel developers. It's very intimidating people. And I just kind of feel like Hillbilly Sarah over here, you know, doing whatever. <laughs> like I'm not terribly well spoken. I'm not the, you know, I wish I was a little bit more of a polished diner, <laughs> just in general. Like there's you all, we always have these little insecurities, but I found that if I could just be my authentic self, then these people were intimidating. If anything, I think it was a breath of fresh air for them because a, you know, 
they're all people too. They put their pants on one leg at a time. Mm -hmm. And B, one thing, especially when it comes to prospecting and knocking on doors and trying stuff, almost every successful person who got to that role that they're in did the same thing. So if yep. you have the guts and the confidence to go up and knock on their door, very rarely have I had doors slammed in my face. Oftentimes, I almost think they're kind of like, oh, you're one of us. Yeah, let's talk. It's such a different vibe. Mm -hmm. because I, but I'm going into it with trying to add value however I can, whether they know I'm adding value or not. So I think just continuing to be my authentic self and, and you know, speaking of your comment about the human connection and people opening up more and not leaving, you know, work Sarah and personal Sarah, like we're blending these two. I have found that if I am my authentic self and share certain vulnerabilities, it just invites other people to do the same. And it's such a different connection that we can build. And now if I need something from a business standpoint, I don't, I don't feel uncomfortable calling and asking for the favor because it's mm -hmm. just that build up and that joint connection point, it's at that point, it's just business becomes seamless because why wouldn't they want to work with you? You know, about, you know, their struggles with their kid or the, the, you know, their aging parent, whatever that connection point is. But I, I agree. I think we need to open the door and be a little bit more human at work. Cause I think that's what people are really craving and that's what helps connect us. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. So as you're, well, when we were talking well, I'm going to back up. I'm going to back up just a bit. Toughest prospecting you've ever had to do. Oh, my gosh. I have, I have a good <laughs> one. And he would, he would let me talk about it, too, because now we're friends. But it was um, largest construction project in the entire country. And I was chasing it hard. And the client is a very high profile developer, you know, second in command at a very well-known hotel brand. Yep. And um, we're doing the meeting and I'm pretty good at reading the situation. So I can be all chit chatty, Sarah, at the beginning. But if the, if the other person isn't matching that energy, I save my chit chat for the end, but I still find a way to do it because it's important. <laughs> um, but this particular gentleman was just so tough. I mean, so tough. And so we went through, went through the presentation. He kept trying to, you know, I got shushed once and that was a little, ooh, that, was oh, a wow. that one. Yeah, but I did it, you know, got through it. And I definitely, I think having confidence in the product in your industry helps because I've, mm -hmm. I've mastered how to keep control and stay in the driver's seat. Um, second meeting, I fly to the, to the state, the city that this project's in, I set up this really big, I spent a lot of money on this meeting or rented a room, um, at a conference room. I accidentally gave him the wrong address. So he was an hour late, shows up at the wrong address. He had to walk through a very hot city to get to my meeting. So there's no time for chit chat there. We just went right into it. I apologized once I didn't, you know, grovel, but, um, we ended up not winning the project. And this is such a small world story. Like two months later in Los Angeles, I happened to be at a restaurant and he was at the same restaurant visiting a friend just from out of town. And so now, you know, I already didn't win the project. And I said, man, I have to ask, like, you were such a hard ass. Like, why were you so tough? Like, you're the toughest person I've ever had to sell to. And he said, Sarah, Every single person, every manufacturer from the entire world is chasing me for this project. Yeah, Like yeah. I had to come up with a filter system and he just did it in maybe a more aggressive way than, than I'm used to. But I think that having that little perspective shift has helped me even when I approach people. And he did say, he said, you were really good at being persistent without being annoying. <laughs> and that's also a delicate dance, the pleasantly persistent. But if you're always adding value, then that becomes a lot more easy to do. So mm -hmm. I've definitely had, um, you know, I've commercial construction. I've been yelled at quite a bit and you just have to learn that it's not personal. I think um, well, I had a mentor tell me once, cause I'd get upset that I'm being yelled at for something that wasn't my fault. And I told him was going to happen. One of the things that he said is just focus on the facts and that always helps. And I think once mm -hmm. you do it enough, Usually, if you go through some type of turmoil together with a client, you come out the other side, your relationship is that much stronger. So sometimes mm -hmm. if you can look at some of those tougher deals and tougher conversations as a gift, because you're going to learn from it. And then if you come out the other side together, you can always reference that back. Like, hey, remember when I saved your butt over here? <laughs> you know, and yeah. find ways to make sure like I'm not going to leave you hanging when shit hits the fan. And I think that is 
is a blessing and a lot of times sucks to go through it, but you come through it on, on the other side a lot, a lot more connected. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Nothing like a tough situation to build a relationship in, in business. That's for sure. And uh, when you're, when you're consistently there doing what you need to do, that's those, those forge very nice long-term relationships. Yeah. And I think when it comes to prospecting, especially with clients that we're intimidated by, a lot of times if you're adding value, there's nothing scary about reaching out. It's like, hey, Damon, do you want to be on my podcast? Hey, Damon, you want to grab lunch together? You know, it's like if you don't respond to me at the end of the day, what are you going to say about me? This girl invited mm -hmm. me to lunch. Like it's it's as long as you're adding value, it's not ever going to come across as obnoxious or annoying. Yeah, that's a great point. So you, you talked about confidence in adding value. Now, some people are going to be in this situation where they're doing business development and prospecting. And they they may or may not have 100% confidence in what they're prospecting mm -hmm. for. What are some tips for them? Because I think that, you know, when you're all in, it's a different thing when you're in, I'm here and I want to do a good job, but I might not be all in. You know, I think that's a great question. And I think one of the biggest um, misses that I see, so I would almost say prospecting is like up to getting the meeting, right? It's networking, yeah. and it's calling people, it's like getting the meeting. But once you get the meeting, what happens next? And I think one of the best ways and most impactful ways that people can really make sure that they're maximizing their time and, and navigating that situation that you just described is it is okay to ask the other person. And I think most importantly, if you can ask about your client's business model and how they go to market, I think a lot of times people assume that if they ask those questions, it makes them appear less confident or it makes them appear that they don't know the industry that they're mm -hmm. in. And it's so easy and it is a game changer if before you start the meeting, it's, hey, Damon, um, before we get going, you know, I researched your firm. I, I really excited to learn more about, you know, exit your way and understanding what you provide. But instead of me just assuming, would you mind taking a few minutes to tell me about your business model so I can better cater my comments to your needs? Because what that does is then that gives you kind of the floor to give me the breakdown of what your business is. But you might share a lot of stuff that you're building or that isn't found on your website or mm -hmm. that my product ends up becoming a great fit to. So I think what happens, you know, I was I've been in construction for a long time. Let's say you're going to present to an architecture firm and you do your research on their website and they build a bunch of hotels on their website. So you go to the presentation, happy to be here. I'm Sarah. And you do your whole pitch around hotels. Well, maybe they don't have any hotel projects right now. They're working on hospitals and higher education, but you just wasted their whole hour talking about something that doesn't apply to them. So I think that's where I see you immediately step in a pothole when you could just take one minute and ask what's your point. Your business model. What are your roles? Like who's in this room? That's going to be a game changer on how you overcome your confidence. And sometimes your product might not be a great fit and that's okay too. I can't tell you how many times like I walked away from the Minnesota Vikings new stadium because I knew the product I was selling wasn't a fit. And that, that decision maker respects me so much. The next project that I got that was a fit, I was his first phone call because I didn't sell him something that would have been a poor fit. So even if it's not the right fit, it's okay to walk away because you're adding value. And part of the adding value is not giving them a product that they're going to be unhappy with. That we just need to just need to simmer on that a little bit because that is one of the biggest things I think in long term. Uh, success really depends on that is if you truly want to add value, you're going to say, we're not right for this. Right. Yeah. That's so good. So good. Actually, I wrote about that a couple of weeks ago in a post on LinkedIn because you need to turn people down. Yeah. And even if they want to, and they're and you know, they're not the right fit. And like many companies in the beginning, we, we took a lot of clients on that we were, were questionable, not a lot, but we took some clients on that were questionable and, you know, even if you're doing your best work, even if you're you're doing everything you can, you still can't bridge that gap if they're not the right right in the first place. 
and 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 it never comes out that your products or services it's always that your it's always your deal but mm -hmm. that's what i'm just saying it's always your deal by by not not stepping back on that at the right times well and that's so. that's where like asking questions and listening really helps because i i just bought a software service and i told the sales rep exactly what i wanted to do he asked me no question just said yeah i can do all of that and it has been a really unpleasant experience you know i had a call with them the other day i was like i'm this close to doing a podcast episode about what not to do but i would never do it without talking to leadership first because if he had just asked me or probed a little bit more he would have set that expectation and then i would have had my expectations set like it's just a little bit of questions and listening it's just not that hard it's not that difficult if you just take the time to ask listen and pivot accordingly that's awesome that's awesome. And I love listening to you talk about it because you know how it should be done. And that's great because you, you can see, you can spot it from a mile away. It's so funny being on the buyer side now. I mean, I'm like getting a crash course and some people do awesome. Some people are super pushy, but I'm okay with pushy. But then I refer them to someone and they don't like how pushy it is. It's just kind of interesting to be on the other side of it. That is for sure. That is for sure. So you're out and about, you're teaching people how to, how to sell better, be better prospectors, figure out their prospecting their companies. What are some of the things that you see out teaching people right now that you feel that a lot of companies are missing? Yes, that's a great question. I think one of the biggest takeaways that I have seen and part of, part of was a hypothesis before I started the business. And now I keep getting confirmation. I think many times people fall into sales roles and there's never been any real structure or tactics or strategies on how to be a successful or effective seller. I think that a lot of times people end up in sales roles because they were good at X, Y, Z, or they're the owner of their own company and they have to be a salesperson, but nobody is really out there teaching the how to do it. And so I, when I started the business, I kind of sat and I thought, okay, if I was going to explain to someone who's never heard of it before, what is prospecting? I literally drew a tree branch. I drew a tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wrote like all the different branches of the tree. Like, how would you do it? And then I put it in an order. And that's how I kind of started building out the content and the structure for the workshop was around from day one. If you didn't know, how would you do it? And what order would you do it in? So I think that just the fact that people don't, <laughs> they just learn by doing, which is fine. And that's really important, but that's not the most effective way to go out and strategically surround a project, surround a sale, communicate the right way, speak to the business model. Like that is a missing piece. And that's where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm putting all my chips in that missing piece because I quit my job and started a business. And that's where yeah. I want to focus because it's an area, it's a big gap that I see. A, I think you're right, first of all. And B, the question I have to that is, what were some of the things that you had just thought everybody knew mm. that you, when you're building this tree, that you go, you didn't even, maybe you didn't even think about writing it down on the tree at first, but now you've gone back and, and did some additions. What were some of those things that you, you said? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to give one that's going to make some people squirm. But I think the I, when people say that they're terrible at names or bad at names, I just think that's so rude. And if you are in a sales role and your job is to convince someone else, to influence somebody else to buy your product or service, and you can't remember their name, and not only don't you remember it, but then you tell them that you're bad at names, like... It's okay if you are bad at names, but there's different ways you can work around it. There's different ways you can say that phrase. So I think that's something that like, if you're in a sales role, you have to be comfortable using people's names. You, it's just rude not to, I'm sorry. It's just telling the other person that you're not worth my time or effort to try to remember your name, but also do you want to buy my product? You know, it's just so, it's just such a miss for me. So I think if you're genuinely interested in others, one of the easiest first steps is using their name in a thoughtful way. Virtual selling is so easy. I just have a notepad and I write down people's names. And then as we're going through it, I just look at my notepad. Right? There's so many workarounds for it. Um, I have a 
podcast episode on it. It's like 25 minutes long, all about tips and tricks. So we can, we can put that in the chat, but it just like, that's one piece. I think that, um, in sales too, we just go into what I call like product vomit. Oh yeah. No. And it's, and everyone does it. You walk a trade show floor and you are just standing there and all of a sudden somebody's coming up talking to you about this widget. Manufacturing industry is quite guilty of it too. You mm -hmm. know, they just assume if you're standing in the booth, you're interested in the products. Like that is the biggest miss. You're at a trade show. You have a badge. It says the person's name. Hey, Damon, what do you do in Seattle? What brings you to the show? I call them like mild icebreakers. Like that one second of time is going to change the way that you communicate to that other person. So I think just i think people think sales is just being really good at knowing your product and that's part of it but it it's a huge miss if you don't take the time to build the relationship first because it's going to turn people off people are going to let all that stuff roll off their brain it's it, so i think that's another piece like people just regurgitating product facts instead of weaving in stories understanding their business model and fitting in solutions to it um so yeah product vomit not knowing people's names I, th I think another huge, huge piece that people miss is let's, I'm just going to use a networking event as an example, because I experienced it when I when I left my job and started the business. Now, you know, I didn't have a manufacturer attached to my name because I was representing mm -hmm. myself and I'd meet people and they'd realize I, I wasn't another vendor or I wasn't a potential client and they'd walk away from me. And I think that not leveraging your network of understanding how you can add value to others, but then eventually take that deposit back. Like I, I just, it, it blew my mind because I've had so much success by friendships with other vendors, right? Like, Hey, you might have a contact I need. Hey, let's do a joint event together. Hey, you know, I, it, it boggles me that people would just blow me off because I didn't have a company name, you know, besides mm. Inc. So I think that's another piece is we assume a lot about other people we don't ask questions to understand why they're there or what they do. And then we also don't spend time if we don't deem the other person worth our time. And that translates very, very clearly to the other person. So if you can approach every conversation as how, how can I add value to this person, then that's really what's going to be the pivot point. Yeah. Yeah. You, just, you just put a bunch of my pet peeves, Damon. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's awesome, though. That's awesome, though. And I think I thought it was funny because I mispronounced your last name. I had it written down here and I oh, still did it. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm just demonstrating what. <laughs> Murphy Murray, it's okay. I'm, I'm, no, it no. happens, but that's okay. But it's not a big deal. You know, it's like we don't yeah, make a big just... deal. I give you a bad time. Yeah. yeah, I, got, yeah. I got far. I got, I, I'll screw up 10 times more before we're done today. So yep. the, when we got, we got talking, you know, you, you hit one thing that I think is, is really something because I, I, I uh, I've seen a lot of people that, that worked for companies where when I pull my business card out, it's got a name on there that opens doors. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, you your experience in both sides of this yeah so what were some of the realizations that you you said first people might walk away but i mean when you're out in the out in doing what you do what are some of the things that you think that people that are going in that situation right i used to work for just say just pick company big you know whatever you want to do i work for apple or whatever or google or just pick one that you feel like and now i don't mm -hmm. now i'm working for a startup that nobody knows and I'm selling what, what are some of the things that they need to be, be prepared to do that they didn't do before? Yeah, I think, um, that's a great question. And I wish I had prepared a little bit more for it because I wasn't expecting to be, you know, so poo pooed on from people that I'm like, Oh yeah, you don't know who I am. You know, it's a little like your ego. I think number one would be check your ego and make sure that, okay. you know, you're not, um, you're not, it's going to suck. Like, it's just going to suck. And I think I'm just, gonna, <laughs> just like be aware it's going to be tough. But at the same time, I think it's just going to suck. <laughs> but I also think it says more about the other person than you. Like, it I does. Think it's it really does. About the other person. So I just leaned in hard to the people that didn't care if I didn't have a name attached, you know, a 
enterprise corporation attached next to my name, I'd lean into those people and I'd use it almost as a filter system. Like, all right, man, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> I'm not mm-hmm. going to waste my time on you. I'm going to gravitate towards the people that don't need that name attached to me. That's one piece. I also think, um, okay. So lean in towards the people that, that don't care or that, that, accept it. I actually think in some ways, I personally feel like I'm able to get different meetings now because I'm not trying to sell them anything. So they think, and I've been pretty surprised by what type of seats at the table I can get now that I don't have the other name attached to me, because now I can approach people. I've been approaching old clients and they're in influential roles, but now I'm not selling them anything per se. It's honestly a lot easier to get the meeting and more relaxed to get the meeting. Um, so I think that you can lean into that and enjoy what your what this new role is giving you. It might open a lot more doors that you would have never expected. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think you make a great point. Because there are going to be people that snub you because you don't have the big name on your business card. But there are also going to be people that would snub you with the big name or mm-hmm. or walk away because they think that's not for right. us that, you know, or it's, it's just not a good fit. So that's that's really, that's awesome. That's awesome. Because I th- I. I see a lot of people that can that sell for big companies with big names. Right. You see you walk around and and you really wonder how that would be for them if they weren't in that in that situation well it's funny i went from a small company to a big name company and one of the biggest things that i didn't realize and i didn't appreciate i I mean i i've experienced it so i'll tell this group too if you have a big name company where you don't have to do the little elevator spiel like i used to sell a smaller product that was a bioethanol fire fuel source so i'd call someone and be like this is sarah calling from so and so uh, it's bioethanol fuel. Da, 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 da. Like I'd have to do this whole spiel to get them to understand where I was calling from to then start the reason for my call. When you work for a big name that people know, it's like, this is Sarah from so-and-so. They're like, oh, what do you need? So I think if you have that luxury mm. and that benefit, make sure that you appreciate it. And if you're on the pros and cons, if you're going to go work for a smaller firm, Honestly, it might make the list because you're going to have to figure out your elevator speech. And I would recommend... If your product solves your product solves a particular problem, I would just focus on that. Like when I sold bioethanol fire, I would just cold call, walk into firms, and I just say really loud, vent free fire. And people would perk up and I'm like, oh, I have a fire. I'm having a hard time venting it. Like find what problem your product solves and find a way to weave that into your little spiel because that's going to get them mentally there quicker. Ah, the problem it solves. Yep. Great. Great, great. So as you're going down the road here with your own business, we talked about this a little bit getting a get before we got on. You've you've kind of found what your why is. Let's talk about that a little bit. What really brought you around and, and kind of showed you more about that? Yeah, I think I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this with you because I think you're the perfect person to talk about it with. And it I kind of only had this little epiphany a couple of weeks ago. But, you know, when you start a business and you're hiring consultants to build your branding and you're reading the business books and everyone, everyone, I can't tell you how many people said it to me. What is your why? Find your why. What's your why? Figure, write a paragraph on what your why is. Like, it happened all the time. And it was stressing me out because I, I feel <laughs> like, I mean, my wives seemed so self-serving. It's like, well, I have the opportunity to build a business around my passions and I've always wanted to build a business and now's a good time for me to do it. But like, they were all about myself. I want to make money. I want more freedom. Like they were all self-serving. I didn't really have a why that felt authentic and I'm not going to put something out there if it doesn't feel real and authentic just for the purpose of having a why. Like I read the book. I get the, I get it, (laughs) but I just didn't really have one. And I think one of, I just finally figured it out very recently, but it didn't happen on day one. And I think that's something I almost wish somebody would have said is you don't need the why on day one. 
number one, it's going to change over time and you only find it by continuing to take action. And so I, you know, I'm looking back at all the different steps I've taken in the year and some change that I've been in business. I did a workshop a couple weeks ago. It was a full day workshop for a team of 12. Um, everyone, you know, more been in the industry a long time, but excited to learn new tools. Everyone was super engaged. It was such a great, great day. And we took a break because we're all sales professionals. So I build in time to answer emails and get back to customers because I, you know, laptops down, but we'll oh, make yeah. sure you have time to get back to clients. So I think our first break was around 90 minutes in the day. And so, you know, we started at nine at 1030. We have our first break. And I walk into the owner's office and I said, hey, how do you think everything's going? Like, how's the team responding? And she looked at me and she said, you are changing people's lives. You are changing their lives. And that was not what I was expecting. And I was like, oh, great to hear. You know, like I didn't have a good response. And so then I walk outside the office and someone in the group pulls me aside and they said, I just want to let you know, you've changed my life already. And I'm like, like it's almost I, I we teach about being prepared for objections in the in the sales yeah, workshop, yeah. and I wasn't prepared for. That's the opposite side of that. Yeah, I, like, <laughs> I feel like I didn't handle it very well because I was like, "Oh, thank you so much." Like I need to have almost a script to respond to that because it's such a heavy thing to be told, and I've yeah, never I've never been told that before. And I, you know, I um someone called me the other day, and they took a really big risk on a VP job with equity, and they said to me, they said, "I." bet on myself and I learned how to do it by watching you. And I, I told him, I said, oh my gosh, I got to tell you two days ago, these people told me I was changing their lives and I didn't know how to handle it because, well, you're teaching people how to make more money. You know, if you're more effective at sales, the company wins. You ideally as an individual win because your commission or your bonus or your, you know, you progress in your role if you're an effective seller. And if you make more income, that does change your life. So I yeah. feel like now now I have more confident when I'm going out and selling the program to people because I know it can change people's lives. But I didn't start the day one saying, I'm going to change people's lives. Like it just, it's one of those things where, you know, it's an object, it's a, it's not an objective black and white thing, but it's been very fulfilling, very rewarding. And so I want to just keep chasing that feeling. And, and that's really my why is to find those things that fuel me and motivate me. Cause that is, that is a lovely way to spend a career. And I feel very grateful to, to be doing it. That's awesome. I just, I just, I tear up when I hear, hear you tell that story because when it hits you, it hits hard and you don't know what to say. Yeah. Oh, you don't know I, what to say. I, oh, yeah. I, I got a, I got a, a gift from a podcast listener with a two page note about how much I've changed her prospecting game, her confidence. She sent me, she uh, makes swag products. So if anyone needs swag product, let me know nice. and I'll connect you. But, um, I, you know, I got a whole box of swag product and a two page letter and I'm just crying and I have it yeah. on my whiteboard. So it's, it's been very rewarding because that's an effect I didn't realize was going to happen. And, and one of the biggest shifts for me in this type of business versus a sales role, more, more traditional sales role is I had a shift from having like an income business model where you're measuring on quarterly goals, like numbers were my driver. Now I'm trying to pivot to be an impact business model. How many people can I impact? And that's, that's been a shift that you have to go through, mm -hmm. but you only go through it by taking the action. And it's been fun because then I get to talk to people like you on a on a lovely Thursday afternoon. So it's been very fun. You never know where the road's going to take you. So awesome. So awesome. I just love hearing, hearing your stories, Sarah, and, and how you're helping because it is, you're helping people do something that can help them change their lives. And, and it's a, it's a triple because the businesses benefit from it too. Right. Ex and, yeah, exactly. Win, win, win is always the goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. So you got a couple of, a couple events coming up. What, what you got coming up? Yeah. So I have two virtual events, really easy. You can do it from your own home. So I have a free workshop. It's called Prospecting on Purpose Live. That's November 3rd at 9 a.m. Um, Pacific time, excuse me, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 Eastern. It's on Zoom. It's one hour. We basically go through the tools that we've been talking about today, Damon, but very like structured. Like, how do you build confidence? How do you have your values? How do you then bridge the gap with your intimidating clients? How do you be more confident approaching them? So it's a jam packed session. It's super fun. There's lots of prizes. Um, it's really fun. So that's a nice. free event. It's on Zoom um, November 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. And then a prospect on purpose live is like the precursor it's the pre-work to um, a paid sales workshop 
called Ace Your Sales. Uh, it's three days, November 7th, 8th, and 9th. That's Tuesday through Thursday. It's one hour a day. It's a really easy time commitment. We go through the seven crucial skills of effective selling. Day one is action. Day two is communication. And day three is execution. So um, if you want to learn more about that, I can drop it in the chat. But it's sarahmurray.com forward slash November. And all the details can be found there. Very good. Sarah, without an H, murray.com forward slash November to check out the webinars that she's got coming up. It sounds incredible, incredible stuff there, Sarah. So, and you dropped it into the chat as well. So good stuff there, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And I just, just appreciate you. I appreciate you coming by and sharing your thoughts about prospecting, your thoughts about life and, and just hearing your progress and, and how you're helping people with their prospecting skills. And I'm sure you're going to help a lot more people. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. I'm happy to be on Faces of Business. Yeah, that's so awesome. And I want to say, Christian, Christian Forty. Yes, I know you're going to baseball. I, 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 yes, I might have been on the baseball boards a long time. I can't hit a baseball anymore. My son, he struck me out so many times. I can't even tell you. So, and Ahmed, thanks for being here today as well. And everyone else that was listening, thank you. Thanks. We love you. When you can, when you can go back, hit the replay. Sarah did drop so many golden nuggets of information here to help us really always be adding value, as you said. And in that prospecting journey, when you're doing that, you get confidence because you're adding value and it really helps you to, to make, build better relationships and do things uh, that will help your career. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Just hang out for a minute and we'll catch up. <laughs>